national forest to the people out west. It's cultural, it's habitat for wildlife. The national forests are public lands and there's millions and millions of acres of it. They're beautiful, they provide recreation, they provide water. They're this iconic symbol of the American West. What the forest gives me is a sense of peace. This sense or spirit of being free. The healthy forests really contribute to what our American public wants to see. Beautiful aesthetic scenes, clean water and clean air. It's part of our American heritage. So critical to our daily lives and we don't think about them a lot until they go up in flames. There are a few words I use to describe a healthy forest. Mosaic, patchy, inconsistent, widely spaced trees. You know, how I would describe a healthy forest is one that has the capability and the resiliency to actually withstand some natural events like insect and disease, wildfire, drought. My original perception of a healthy forest was one where there were as many trees as possible in as wide an area as possible. I really learned that's not the case. When people fly into Bozeman, Montana, they get off the airplane and they look at the woods around them and there's these dense, thick stands of trees and they look up in the mountains and they go, wow, this is so gorgeous, this is a healthy forest. We need to preserve that, we need to protect that. But what they're trying to preserve and protect is not natural. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Before we would have treated, you, you would have just seen a little more tightly densed um, stock of, of vegetation. The canopies would have been a lot closer. It's easy to come in and see our landscapes and just immediately think, oh, these are just these beautiful, healthy forests. But when you start digging in and collecting data, you realize pretty quickly that a lot of our forests are not healthy. They are densely stocked, they are overgrown. We have some pretty severe insect and disease issues. The scale of some of these stresses, it's much larger than what we what normally would have experienced, you know, 100 years ago. Folks have fall, winter, spring where they live, we have fire season. Overly dense forests, they create so much fuel that can create these high intensity, massive catastrophic wildfires. Many of these habitats evolved with fire, but they didn't evolve with fire at the extreme conditions that we experience now. We're living in the age of the mega fire. We have years where 10 million acres of forest land burns each year. Back in 2021, wildfire emissions released about 130 million tons of carbon into the atmosphere. That's 29 million automobiles on the road for one year and the emissions that they put forth. Climate change is a factor. We have longer, hotter, drier summers. I mean, that's just a fact. But it is not the factor that's resulting in these wildfires. The factor is fuel buildup in our forest. And you can bring forward all the climate change policies you want, but that won't fix what we have on the ground here in our national forest. The product of more than 100 years of fire suppression policy. Our agency has had a long history with fire suppression and successful history with fire suppression. Early in the century, when fire was on the landscape and people didn't have a lot of experience with it, they wanted to see it out. And that seemed and felt right at the time. Over time, we've learned and we now see introducing prescribed burning or managing natural wildfires under the right conditions is critically important so they can maintain their resiliency over time. 
we've learned a lot from Native Americans and their connection to the land. And I think we are much better, much better for it. They were very active in managing natural resources. What we potentially doing what we would call prescribed burning. They understood the importance of good habitat. They could mimic these natural fires that are low to the ground. And we stopped all that. We were born into a culture and society that was taught that fire is the enemy. And like anything, we took it to the extreme. Even a match can be a deadly missile. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Smokey was awesome for the Forest Service, and Smokey was so successful that now when we talk about a slightly different message, it's somewhat hard to overcome in some instances. The last decade or so um, out west where you've seen these mega fires, you know, there are a lot of our communities that believe full suppression of fire is the best way to go. It's the real fear of fire. We have not let fire take its natural world in the landscape. We usually suppress, you know, 98% of our wildfires within the first couple of days. A lot of those fires, they're, they're actually fires that would be doing some good things in the landscape. They're lower severity, maybe moderate severity fires that are gonna be kind of cleaning up the forest, if you will. A healthy forest that is resilient would be able to withstand those type of fires, would be set up in a way to, to accept those type of low to moderate complexity fire. And a lot of our landscape right now, they're, they're just not. The Forest Service is in charge of about 193 million acres of land in America. Of that 193, 80 million acres are in need of forest restoration. The Forest Service today is restoring about 2 million acres a year. It would take us 40 years at the pace we're going to actually restore our forest, and we don't have that kind of time. When you look at the United States, the vast majority of our highest risk acres are out west. The Forest Service's mission is about conservation, and conservation is about active management. We need to manage differently, and we need to manage with a sense of urgency. We're not talking about massive clear cutting. We're looking towards selective thinning of small diameter trees and reintroducing good fire to the landscape. We have crews out there with chainsaws that are cutting these smaller diameter, six to eight inch diameter trees. They're piling them and later in favorable conditions later in the, in the year, we're gonna come back and we'll burn those piles. And it really helps open the understory and really tries to prevent fire from getting up in the canopy. Those combined together are gonna to really start moving the needle and help mimicking what we would have naturally been seeing as an agency, we've pushed for so long that fire is this bad thing. Fire can be a bad thing, and I want to be really clear, fire can be horrible. But there are times where fires can be a good thing. It doesn't have to be these kind of binary choices. In some cases, we really do need to suppress fire. We're going to have to follow that up. For those who think Mother Nature will simply take care of itself, it will, things will evolve. It will evolve in a way that no longer maintains the values and attributes they care about. We've essentially lost 60, 70% of our national forests. They no longer provide clean water. They no longer provide that ecstatic beauty that many people care about. There's some discomfort in, in the community about putting fire on the landscape. But we, we really ask, you know, when, when do we want fire? Do we want it in August when it's uncontrolled? Or do we want fire in October under our control? 99% of our fires go exactly as planned. If we do have a prescribed fire that we start losing control, we've already got crews that are engaged to try to prevent that 1% from happening. So I think the question is, you know, is it worth the risk? 
are we willing to have the trade-offs? Are we willing to have some of the consequences? Bozeman, we have this municipal watershed project. There was recognition years ago that there was a real danger to our water source if we did have a catastrophic wildfire that occurred in, in the woods that we're in today. There's been this project to say, hey, let's eradicate that danger, that threat. It's also been the poster child for bad litigation uh, that has stopped very much common sense science-backed projects. The city of Bozeman, they, they really get just about 100% of their water from National Forest, and 80% and of that comes from the Bozeman Municipal Watershed Project area. We had three separate independent studies that looked at the risk to the watershed and the city of Bozeman's water treatment plant. All three of them said the number one risk would be from the impacts of a high severe fire. If a fire impacted that infrastructure and clogged it up with ash and sediment, the city of Bozeman had about three days worth of water supply and, and that's, that's not very long. That's purely a fuels reduction project. Those stands are just incredibly dense. You know, they are, there's very little to no sunlight. The canopy is basically completely touching each other. We ended up coming up with about a little over 4,000 acres of treatment strategically located for, to protect private property and infrastructure, to protect our firefighters, and ultimately trying to just protect the city of Bozeman's water treatment plant. The BMW project has a lot of history when it comes from the planning perspective. The studies were in the early 2000s. We had a, a really robust scoping process, a lot of community engagement, and, and we, we had a lot of great feedback that we, we fully evaluated with making an informed decision. After we signed our decision, we, we were litigated and, and spent a fair amount of time, several years, addressing the concerns from the judge we had a decision in 2013, but we didn't start implementing until 2020. It sat on the shelf, just gummed up by litigation and permitting and all kinds of obstacles and barriers that were put in this way. With a 80 million acre backlog, we need to rapidly escalate the pace of restoration in the United States. And I think some of that means reform. We feel an urgency behind the work that we're trying to do now in order to have the outcomes we need on the landscape. We're gonna have to have more prescribed burning at a much larger level and a much higher capacity than we have in the past. But it's just not about financial resources. There are a number of policies that we know need to shift in this system that we operate in. There are laws that are on the book, like the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act, which are well-meaning acts, and they're designed to promote more conservation and more wildlife in the United States, but they're also now being used to slow down processes. We have to be able to carve out and account for nuances to get conservation right. This shouldn't be that hard. Those of us who are out here in the field that are doing the work of conservation recognizes that this, this world of polarization is not what brings us better conservation. It's, it's more gray, it's more common sense. It is a long game, right? It took us a century to get here and we're not gonna get out of it in two or three years. All of the nation's forests are in these conditions and it's gonna take all of us in order to deliver on this work. We have to go back retroactively and undo what we did for the last 100 years. We're not happy living in communities that are smoke-filled for seven months of the year. And if people understand and appreciate what the causes of what we're seeing are, better understand what the solutions might be, and better understand the historic and cultural context to it, it can be done. That's what changes policy.